I'm David Toby, Global Product Technology Manager for the Spider Products at Datacolor. We're happy to co-sponsor this uh, webinar with Photodiox, a great place for uh, buying specialty photography products on the web, and DIY Photography, which is uh, an excellent source of photo information, tips, blog posts, etc. And we'll uh, We'll talk more about them at the end of this presentation. Now we will have a number of giveaways. I believe we're going to have 14 separate winners today in our, uh, in our webinar sweepstakes here. So stick around for the end and you may win something from, from one of these companies. And uh, while we're at it, think of this in terms of uh, the special offers that we'll also offer to uh, all attendees at the end of the webinar. So in the meantime, I'd like to make several suggestions. One is that uh, you could set up your screen in such a way that that nice blank space we've left over at the right has the, uh, the go to webinar control panel on it. And then you could open up the questions and answers section so that while this webinar is ongoing, I will do my best to answer questions from any of you that, that, uh, that post questions, please be sure there is a poll in today's webinar. So be sure to use the poll section for your poll answer. If you just type it into the Q&A section, it won't go into the poll. So I will be doing my best to keep up with questions during the webinar. And our speaker of the day, David Saffer, is going to be doing the majority of the presentation, though he's told me he's going to call me in on a few points as we move along. So um, thanks to Photodiox, thanks to DIY, and for those of you who might not be familiar with Datacolor, Datacolor is a preeminent color management company with a focus in the photography and videography fields. So we'll cover color management only as it relates to macro photography in this webinar, but there will be references to things like monitor calibration and, and white point uh, tools as we go along. So you'll have some sense of data color tools by the end of this webinar if, you, if you're not familiar with data color now. So David Saffer is a commercial photographer from uh, Southern California who does commercial and fine art photography, printmaking, writing, teaching. Uh, he works with me on a number of projects in the course of the year. And uh, so today he's going to be the featured speaker on the topic of macro photography. And uh, he's done types of macro I have not and vice versa. So we'll, uh, we'll kind of tag team this to some degree. So uh, I'd like to introduce David and, uh, and welcome you all to our webinar. Thanks, David. Thanks for the nice introduction. <clears throat> this, everybody, this is David Saffer. Glad to have you on board. We're going to have a good time today. We're going to talk about macro photography, and we're going to talk about it from the standpoint of the uh, something of a mix between an introduction and a fairly detailed how-to. We're going to dive into the details in a few areas that I feel that I've heard questions from people in the past, and I can address them effectively here. Um, I want to talk about this photograph here on the front page, which has a kind of a fun story behind it. These bees in California, these black bumblebees, I guess they're called, are really very big. And although this, this particular presentation, the bee is bigger than life size, it's safe to say he's maybe twice life size, which leaves a pretty darn big bee flying around. And they're not very agile in the air. And to top it all off, on this particular day, it was hot and sunny, and a lot of the flowers were fermenting, so the bees were drunk. And as I was taking this picture, um, I used a long macro lens for this. As I was taking this picture, drunken bees were banging off my, the sides of my head and getting tangled up in my clothes uh, and distracting me. I thought I was going to get stung, but uh, I guess they were too drunk to care. But anyway, I thought that was a, a pretty funny incident. Now, macro photography is one of the more technical aspects of, of our work. It involves a range of tools that you could use or that you would want to use. Um, we're taking photographs at a very high level of detail. Macro literally means large scale. Uh, you're looking at life size or greater, a one to one or a one to two ratio. And the really cool thing about macro photography is you really can see into a new world. Um, you can see things that clearly can't be seen um, with the unaided eye. And you can see things um, 
you know, in the natural world that, that you just might pass them by if you were just walking around without, uh, without a camera and a macro lens or some other equipment. It's also interesting that it used to be that macro photography was the realm of people who had a lot of money and or people who were very, very clever at improvising with some of the tools that were available to, without spending a lot of money. But in any event, it, it required either a, a high level of technical expertise and some practice or um, lots of funds. And what I'm seeing now is that a lot of the improvements in small sensor cameras and lenses have made macro imaging much more accessible. I, just as an example, I have a, well, it's now getting a little bit older, a Canon G10, which is almost a pocket camera that has a, a macro setting on it which um, reconfigures the lens and the setup of the camera and it takes very credible macro photographs as long as I use a tripod. So it's not the kind of thing that you have to feel that uh, you need to go out and buy a lot of equipment. Uh, what we're going to do today is introduce you in, 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 to hopefully to some new ideas and different ways of looking at things, uh, different ways to to get your hands on what you might need or you might want to use uh, and spark your imagination to go out and take some great macro photographs. Now, when people talk about macro equipment, um, they're usually referring to a DSLR, but it, as I said before, it can include mirrorless or even pocket cameras. Uh, and it usually in, or does involve a lens with close focusing capability. So a true macro lens has a one to one or one to two reproduction ratio and that pretty much means that your subject is going to completely cover the film plane or the sensor. Now one thing I wanted to mention is that um, there's a lot of macro lenses uh, floating around in the used markets and, and a lot of other lenses right now and one of the reasons is is that the lenses that originally were made for film had coatings that were designed to to correct some of the optical issues that were associated with using film in a camera. When we switch to digital sensors, obviously there's a, a glass covering over that digital sensor and that's much more reflective than the film was, which means that light coming in through the lens is going to bounce off that, that digital filter, it's going to bounce off the back of the lens and bounce around in the box quite a bit and in many cases kill the contrast and maybe be even the color saturation of your image. So a lot of the newer lenses, for example, Nikon calls this its nano coating, have a molecularly deposited coating on the, on the rear element of the lens that reduces that reflection and that's particularly useful for macro photography. So if you're using an older lens in macro photography and you're not happy um, with the level of contrast and color saturation and density that you're seeing, this may be the issue. You may want to borrow or rent a newer lens and see if that improves things. Uh, we're going to talk about, oh, and by the way, as far as macro lenses go, they come in, in lengths anywhere from, I would say, typically 60 millimeters on up to 200 millimeters. The big advantage with the 200 millimeter lens is that you can back up from your subject. With a 60 millimeter lens, your typical close focusing distance is about a half an inch. Um, you can certainly shoot from further away, but the 200 millimeter lens gives you that standoff distance so that if you're photographing bees, for example, it's a little bit more comfortable for you. We're going to talk a little bit about extenders and reversing rings. Uh, we're not going to talk about camera supports, which is, doesn't just include the tripod, but also talk, talks about getting a good foundation. Uh, and part of camera supports can also include um, focusing aids such as a macro rail, uh, the use of remote release uh, as a way of keeping the camera steady. And we're going to talk about a little bit or in terms of mounting or supporting the subject. One of the things that people do very frequently is they don't really provide any support for the subject. The classic example is a flower outdoors in the garden <clears throat> and you're trying to take a macro photograph and the slightest hint of a breeze will ruin your photo because you're so close to the subject that any movement at all, of course in the camera, but also in the subject is going to represent a significant challenge in image sharpness. And we're going to discuss lighting. 
Now, it doesn't matter on your DSLR if it's a DX or FX sensor, in other words, an APS-C or a full-frame sensor. Uh, we did talk a little bit about macro lenses being available in a variety of focal lengths. Uh, one of the great things about macro lenses is that generally you can get closer with a macro lens and focus the camera much closer than you can with a so-called normal lens. Uh, and as I said before, like a 60 millimeter micro Nikkor can get you within a half inch to six tenths six tenths of an inch. Um, macro lenses are inherently inherently designed, deliberately designed to have what's called a very flat field. There's virtually no curvature uh, that can be seen barreling or pin cushioning. Um, they're very bright out to the corners and the reason is of course is that you're working very very close to the subject and they just have to be optically superior. A nice side effect about this particularly if you're working with a 100 or a 120 millimeter macro lenses, they make fabulous portrait, um, portrait lenses. They're extremely sharp. They have great contrast. Uh, they're sharp even when they're uh, op open all the way or op open almost all the way, say at f2.8 or f4. Um, and of course, if you stop them down, they work extremely well. And so they're they're, they really can serve two purposes, and you should keep that in mind, um, that if you're going to get a macro lens, um, the 60 millimeter might be less expensive, but the 100 millimeter would be more versatile. Um, you can do what's called reversing a normal lens. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, that gives you a big increase in diopter or magnification. Uh, and people, there are people who actually stack these or put a normal lens on the camera reverse another lens and attach it with an adapter, uh, such as one of the kinds that you can get from PhotoDeox. Um, you can use magnifier filters uh, as an aid to your optics. They're like a, um, a UV filter or something like that, similar to that, uh, that screws onto the front of your lens. They come in magnifications of plus one, plus two, et cetera, et cetera. It's probably one of the least desirable alternatives, in my humble opinion. Um, they're a good stopgap if you don't want to carry around a lot of lenses or you need something right away that you can use quickly. Um, the magnifiers serve a purpose, but you certainly get much better image quality with a dedicated macro lens or even reversing a normal lens. You can use what's called extension tubes, which effectively lengthen the focal length of the lens. Uh, just as the bellows used to do, and I don't know anybody that's using bellows nowadays, but there are a few people out there. Um, there's a little bit about, we're going to talk in a moment about the lens baby. And, of course, there is software for focus stacking, um, the two of the most notable examples being Adobe and Helicon. Um, David, Toby, you want to say a few words about the lens baby macro setups? Yeah, LensBaby has over the years offered uh, multiple series of lenses and now they offer more lens accessories than they used to. Uh, the simplest and in some ways the most satisfying way to do LensBaby macros is to get one of their um, older like LensBaby 2 lenses um, or get one of their artist lenses rather than their um, you know, more controlled lenses. What you want is the one that's got a rubber tube between the lens and the camera. That rubber tube, they usually talk about pushing on it for focus, but the answer is for macro, you actually pull it out away from the camera. You have to develop a technique where you have a finger on each side of the head of the lens and you stretch those two fingers forward with another finger back against the camera body for support. And as you move in and look through your viewfinder, you can see your, your depth of field and you keep stretching and stretching until you can get almost infinitely close to your subject matter. It used in this manner, it doesn't look like a lens baby image particularly because all lenses kind of distort, particularly around the edges at, at macro range. So lens baby images, while they still um, have, you know, kind of interesting distortions, they don't necessarily jump right out and say lens baby under those circumstances. The next option is to take any lens baby and to put their uh, screw-on adapter magnification lenses onto the front. These are, that's less flexible instead of being able to choose any focal distance from infinity up to an inch the way you can with a, a rubber um, flex 
flexible lens baby, you now have to screw one or more adapters onto the front for a specific um, depth of field. Your flower may not run away, but the bee on it may leave before you get that done. So it's a less flexible but more controlled situation. So if you're doing freehand shooting, I'd say use the artistic type of lens baby. Uh, David Saffer is very much a tripod man, so I'm sure he's shaking his head as I say. <laughs> but there are several of the shots shot in this uh, in this uh, webinar's sample images are freehand lens baby shot, shot with a lens baby too. Um, the next solution, if you're going to start hardwiring lenses on, uh, you can still use that freehand, but it also works much better, more consistent. It gives you a consistent depth of focus, which you won't get out of the, you know, the two fingers and a, and a flexible hose type of solution. And then the third solution is there are actually lens baby extension adapters that go between the camera body and the lens baby. Now, David Saffer um, handed one of these to me when we were doing a lens baby shoot one day in Santa Barbara, but um, since it was configured for his camera, not mine, it was not a Canon mount, I couldn't use it, I could just admire it and hand it back to him. So I've not actually shot with that particular lens baby adapter, so I can't uh, address it directly. But the point is there are multiple methods of getting in close with a lens baby, and uh, simply buying a lens baby composer uh, is not going to give you that because it's, ma it's minimum depth of range, the closest you can get to something and focus on it is, is uh, much farther than it was with, say, the previous generation of the Lens Baby 2. So uh, I found myself, when I first started working with a composer, being frustrated because I'd move in and I'd be out of focus. So uh, you have to be sure you have the right tools, the right Lens Baby equipment for the type of macro work you'd like to use. Thank you. Um, and while you were speaking, I realized there's a typo on here that led me to make an error. On the micro Nikkor, it's not a half an inch, it's half a foot. So my apologies for that. Now, one of the things you can do is reverse a normal lens, and that basically means that you would turn it around backwards, and so that the rear element would actually be your objective element of the lens. You can use an adapter ring, uh, such as one from Photo Deox, um, with, uh, for example, it has a 52 millimeter thread, and turn the lens around and mount it backwards on the camera. Now, one of the issues um, with doing this in the past has been the aperture control, is that the default is, is that when you remove the, the lens from the camera, that the lens automatically resets itself to its widest aperture. Now, there's a couple of things that you can do. Um, some people have some workarounds with particular cameras, and I'm not, I'm not going to try and name which ones, although I think Canon is one of them, where if you put the camera, you turn the camera on and you set the aperture, and by the way, this is for lenses that don't have a, a manual aperture ring on them. Uh, they're controlled electronically. If you turn the camera on and leave it on and remove the lens, the lens will stay at the aperture that you've set it to. Or if the camera is in live view, the camera will stay, um, the aperture will stay uh, at the setting that you've, you've placed it at. Um, there are also adapters from Photo Deox that have tabs or uh, sliders that can help you manipulate the aperture. You, clearly, you don't want to be taking every shot with the aperture wide open or one stop from wide open. Frequently, you want to stop it way down so you can get some decent depth of field. It's a, uh, it's a real issue with, with macro photography. Of course, the closer you get to the subject, um, you know, the, the more your depth of field is affected. Now, a, a camera such as... Uh, you know, my Nikon, I have a, a 50 millimeter lens from Nikon, has a manual aperture adjustment on that lens, and I can set the aperture and flip the lens around and put the uh, adapter on it and take the photo. And again, the diopter effect, the magnification effect from this is very significant and can really get you some really nice macro photographs. Now, extension tubes, they're they're just they're just empty tubes, um, particularly if they don't have the electric connection to uh, help the lens communicate to with the camera. They're placed between, they're placed on the camera mount, and then the lens is mounted to the extension tube. Um, they move your lens further from the camera and the front element closer uh, to the subject, so it shortens your working distance. 
uh, which means that your amount of your uh, uh, practically speaking your magnification the potential for magnification increases some extensions communicate with the camera and others do not and that's going to lead me to the next slide which may drive you crazy at first glance but stay with me uh, I'm going to explain it all and it will make sense I promise so you can stack them and the longer the extension the more light you lose right there's no glass in between uh, and the inverse square rule is going to apply. So if you put an 80 millimeter lens 80 millimeters away, further away from the sensor plane, you lose a stop of light. Now there's a formula down here that looks crazy. It looks like the formula for warp drive. Um, I'm sorry about the noise in the background. It'll go away in a second. Um, the way this formula works is simply you really start in the middle and work your way out. So if you have a 14 millimeter extension on an 80 millimeter lens, you're going to get a loss of about a half a stop. And the way you calculate that with the extension tubes is you take the focal length of your lens, 80 millimeters, and you divide the, the width of the so-called focal length of the extension tube, 14 divided by 80, and you add one. Okay. And then what this part of the formula means is to, is to square it, which is to multiply it by itself, which is very simple on a calculator. So whatever result you get, 14 divided by 80 plus 1, multiply it by itself, you'll get, in this case, a figure of 1.38. You divide that by 2, and it gives you a half a stop, approximately. You can round it off, so, and, it, and, and then you can play with the exposure manually as, as you work with the photograph. So I'll go over it one more time. You're going to take the length of the extension tube, 14 millimeters, divide it by 80 and add 1. That gives you a figure. Multiply that figure by itself, which in this case gives us 1.38. Divide that by 2, and that's the loss of light that you're going to get from the number, from whatever extension tubes you're using. Um, this webinar, by the way, is being recorded, so you'll be able to go back to the webinar at a later date and go over this again. Um, and at the end of the webinar, I'll provide my email if anybody wants to send me questions about any of the content in here. I'll be happy to answer them. Now, here's one of the things where David and I disagree. Um, he likes to shoot freehand without a, a camera support. But I'm a big fan of using camera supports, and, and I need all the help I can get, particularly at my age. So I'm looking for control and stability to give me the kind of precision that I want in macro photography. Uh, a sturdy tripod. Um, one of the things that, that does trouble me is that there's a lot of lightweight tripods coming out right now. They have four leg segments. Um, I strongly recommend that you don't fully extend a four leg segment tripod unless it's got a very, very heavy setup. That fourth leg really seems to lend a lot of vibration to the whole um, the whole construction. Uh, you want a gear head or a ball head. A gear head has adjustments um, that are, there's, there's sort of like a rack and pinion gear on a car, and you can step by step move the camera millimeter by millimeter to get it exactly where you want. Um, one of the other things that I, I recommend is a macro focusing rail, which you can see where my cursor is right down here. One of the things about focusing with macro is that very, very small movements in focus give big results, right? You're very close, you're magnifying the image or the subject, and it doesn't take much, first of all, to bump the camera, but second of all, to throw the part that you want in focus uh, out of whack. And it, although it can be done with a manual focusing ring, the smart way to do it is to set the camera on manual focus, get yourself a, um, one of these gadgets, this is from Really Right Stuff, you mount the camera right here on this dovetail, and this vernier knob here moves the camera forward and backward and gives you your focusing capability. In other words, you're moving the whole camera to focus instead of trying to fill with the focusing ring, which is a blunt instrument at best. Autofocus has its own problems, but I recommend manual focus. I recommend that you use the focusing ring if you can't get a focusing rail. Uh, but if you can get a your hands on a focusing rail, it is 
the bomb when it comes to doing this kind of work. Even if you're doing product photography in the studio, this device is extremely handy. Very, very sturdy, heavy duty, stable. Um, and if you get one of these L brackets, which mounts to the tripod mount on the camera, and you can see that it has a dovetail on the left side of the camera and a dovetail on the bottom, it's very easy to shoot a vertical or a horizontal simply by opening this flip lever, dropping the camera in, taking your shot, and if you decide to switch to the other orientation, you can flip the lever open, turn the camera, drop it in, and lock it down. Very, very positive uh, lock, easy to control, and it's much faster to work with. So as David said before, if that bee is going to fly away, proficiency with your tools is, is really a requirement. You know, it's a requirement to catch that bee before he flies away. One of the other things that people neglect to use is a remote shutter release. Now, some would say, well, why not use the self-timer on the camera? That might work OK for a landscape shot where things are still life, where things aren't moving around. But if you really want to time the shot, a remote shutter release is, is really the way to go. Um, there are some electronic versions that are available now that are very reasonably priced. They can also act as interval timers. Uh, I suggest you consider one if you don't have it. It's, um, I think it's an indispensable part of the stuff that's in my bag. Now we're going to take a minute and, and do a poll, if you don't mind. We'd just like to know which equipment you currently use on a regular basis. You can check all that apply. A tripod, a focusing rail, extension tubes, reversing adapters, or in a macro flash bracket or ring flash. Well, one thing I'm glad to see is 98% of the people use a tripod. Uh, it's very interesting to me that only 7% are using a reversing adapter. That's something that you might want to consider, again, because of the diopter effect. And you can also, if you go to the Photo Deox page, they have some interesting instructions on how to, um, and I believe that DIY photo photography also has some material on this, on how to stack lenses, reverse one and, and mount one and reverse the other one, and really get some incredible magnification effects. Now, macro setup tips. One of the things that a lot of people don't do is they don't bring things indoors. Now, obviously, you're not going to bring a beehive in the house, but flowers, other still life subjects, gives you an opportunity to control your lighting. And by that, I mean either continuous or strobe lighting. Um, one tip about continuous lighting and florals and things like that is the heat will quickly wilt your subject. So you may want to consider strobes for florals and other delicate um, you know, living things. But you do want to control your lighting. You want to have diffusers, soft boxes. Um, those kinds of, of, of um, accessories so that you can, really, you can control the light. One of the main reasons for this is that in macro photography, you see a lot of photographs that have specular highlights. You really want to get some ripstop nylon between the light source and your subject or a diffuser or bounce the light off a piece of uh, foam core or, or just about anything that, that would soften the light a little bit. It will give you a chance to protect the details, it will give you a chance to um, keep those specular highlights where you don't want, you know, away from the photograph if you don't want them there. Another thing I suggest is experiment with high key versus low key. I would say that three quarters of the macro photography that I see um, is high key. It's got a bright background and a bright subject. And although this picture here isn't necessarily a true macro photograph, it certainly illustrates the usefulness first of side lighting, which gives a lot of dimension. You can see the, the saturation and the detail and the dimensionality in this image are really pretty fantastic. Um, but also the dark background really aids in the dimensionality of the subject. It brings all, of, you know, bright things come forward in a photograph and dark things go back. Things that are in focus come forward and things that are out of focus go back. Um, 
And so try some of these things. Work with a low-key setup or a dark background and see how you do. You may find that it really helps you to isolate your subject and gives you a better macro image than you might have gotten otherwise. Another thing uh, that I strongly suggest that you do is support the subject. And that can involve anything from a little bit of fishing line and a couple of clothespins to some lightweight wire to you can actually go out and buy um, mini tripods or supports that, that clamp onto the subject and, and help hold it where you want it to be when you're taking your photograph. Now, one of the things I want to mention here is um, down below you can see that this is fairly elaborate lighting setup from Nikon. Uh, twin lights, this is the sort of thing that a dentist might use in some cases, but it can also be very use for, useful for field photography. If you, one of the, the classic things in macro photography is on-camera flash, and, and this device is actually the controller for these two flash units that, that are located at 9 and 3 o'clock as far as the uh, sensor plane is concerned. But what a lot of people do will mount a, is to mount a flash right here, and there's a couple of issues that, that go along with this. First of all, if the flash isn't mounted properly or it's not on an extension, you're going to see a shadow from the lens of the lens shape. The second thing is, is that frontal lighting is brutal. It's brutally flat. It flattens out the subject. It doesn't really allow for any um, dimensionality uh, you know, beyond the obvious. It doesn't give you an, a chance to help model the subject and really bring the best out in terms of lighting and, and your final print or image on screen. So um, I strongly suggest that if you, if you can't uh, afford or don't want to have two lights like this, at least get an extension cable and get that flash unit off camera. That sometimes may mean holding the flash unit in one hand and the remote release in the other, but that's not that big a hassle. Now, one of the other things that I think is, um, you know, we're running pretty far ahead of schedule. Um, David, if there's any questions that are coming through that I can answer um, live online, please let me know. Um, one of the things about capture color control is that each camera and lens has its own color signature. And you can enhance your exposure performance by exercising some capture color control. Uh, you can use in-camera white balance or you can create a custom white balance. But when you create a custom white balance, you really do get a bump in color performance. Now, one of the devices that's made by Data Color is called the Spider Cube. And the difference between the Spider Cube and using the in-camera white balance is, is, pardon the pun, kind of like night and day. Um, you can use the controls on the back of the camera to set the white balance to an approximate level. Uh, so for example, incandescent, roughly 3,000 flash, roughly 5400 Kelvin, et cetera, et cetera. But I guarantee that in, in any situation except a, a, a high-end flash unit, you're going to be working with ambient color temperature that's not going to be one of these numbers. Even if it's cloudy, it's not going to be 6,000. It's going to be 7,100. Or in the shade, it's going to be a different number. And so that's going to affect the color temperature of your photographs. Well there's a couple of issues that are involved with that, but one of them is, let me just flip forward a minute, make sure I've got the, I don't have that extra slide on here. One of them is, is that the preview that you're seeing on the camera is driven by the white balance the camera is, is uh, applying to the image at that time. Even though it's a raw photo, what you're seeing on the screen is a JPEG. And the camera is basically calculating that JPEG from all the variables of exposure and white balance, et cetera, et cetera. That JPEG is also being used to generate the histogram that you're seeing. So if the white balance is not quite right, what you're seeing on the back screen is not quite right. The answer to this is to take the spider cube, fill the frame, take a shot of the spider cube, and set the custom white balance using the controls on the back of the camera or in the LCD menus. From that point forward, you're going to see a better JPEG, 
the out of limits, the blinkies uh, warnings are going to be more accurate. You're going, if you should be able to see the black trap in the middle of the spider cube if the exposure is correct. You should not see the blinkies in the white areas. The only area you should see the blinkies is in the, in the chrome ball, the specular highlights. In other words, it's going to help you fine tune your exposure to protect your highlights and your shadows. Your histogram is going to be more accurate. And you're in general going to get a, a better photograph uh, out of your session. Now, if you place the spider cube in the shot, um, this is a, a, a software application called Capture One Pro, but this also applies to Aperture, Lightroom, um, uh, you know, the Adobe products, et cetera, et cetera. I told you camera raw and got tongue tied for a second there. If you, if there's always a white eyedropper or a gray eyedropper, and if you go over to that first shot that has a spider cube in it, you can color neutralize the photograph very, very effectively. It's a bit like a white a gray card, but it has one advantage is that the spider cube is three dimensional. So you can pick the brightest side of the gray area knowing that that is your primary light source. That's where the majority of your light is coming from. And therefore you're going to color correct to that light source or not as you choose. And then you can apply that white balance in any of these software packages to the other images in that lighting setup. Very, very handy, very accurate, um, and will improve the quality of your images. Now, let's talk a little bit about um, focus stacking. I want to flip forward for a second here. Okay. Pardon me. Um, this is, a, this is a, a tool that's relatively new. When this first came out, I really couldn't believe it worked. It almost seemed like it was voodoo or magic. And really what it involves is combining multiple images of the same subject. You're going to use identical framing. You're going to shoot it in manual exposure mode and manual focus. Um, a 105 millimeter lens at f16 has a depth of field of about a half a millimeter. So on a shot like this where you've got the flower tilted away from the camera, angled away from the camera, it's really not possible to have the entire, and particularly the middle part of the flower, which is what I was working on, I was most interested in, to have all of this be in focus. But with focus stacking, you can actually achieve that. And it can be used in any subject where depth of field is an issue. A lot of people use it in macro photography and photo microscopy. But now there's people that are beginning to use it in landscape and architectural work as well. And it's a very, very effective tool. You take multiple shots and you use with different focal points, multiple shots of the same scene or same subject. You use the software to blend or combine and create an image that has what we call non-planar focus. In other words, it's, the focus is not in one plane. It's actually in multiple planes. Now, sometimes this can be done with a tilt shift lens or a view camera. but my guess is, is that few of us um, are willing to spend the time and the money to do, to do that for this kind of work. And, and it's, that's great for architecture and landscape, but in areas where perhaps you have living subjects, that's a pretty hard thing to do. So what one does is, and here's an example, is you take a photograph, and I put these red dots just to illustrate different points of focus in multiple photographs. So every time I trip the shutter, I move the focal point. And again, you can use a macro focusing rail or you can use manual the manual focusing ring on your camera. Um, when I first started doing this, a friend of mine gave me a tip. And he said, David, if you think you've taken enough pictures, you probably haven't. And his point was, is start with the uh, part of the object that's closest to you and work your way to the back of the image and take more pictures than you think you need. And the reason is, is that when the software goes to blend all of these together, if you've missed a spot, it's going to show. It's going to show as a blurry area. So better to have too many. It may take the computer a little bit longer to blend them all, and that's, that's really the only downside to doing that. Um, the other tip I want to give you is, and this is my favorite trick, don't bump the tripod with your foot while you're doing this, because if you move the camera, you have to start over. It has to be an identical frame, 
manual exposure, in other words, shutter and, and aperture, and the only thing that you're going to change is the point of focus. You import all of the photographs. This is Adobe Camera Raw. You import all of the photographs, and as long as you apply your adjustments to all the photographs equally, you use the synchronized tool, uh, as long as you apply your adjustments to all the photographs equally, um, you will have a good result. So in, in Adobe Camera Raw, you would take the first photograph and you would make your adjustments, say, to color temperature, exposure, or clarity, or vibrance, whatever. And then you can go select all and synchronize, and it will apply those adjustments to all those photos. Then you can click Done. And you can import the photos as layers in a single image in Photoshop. And I'm not going to get into the details of that here, but the tutorial is brief. Uh, relatively brief and it's available through the help screens um, in Photoshop. You're going to bring all of these layers into Photoshop and you're going to go to edit auto blend layers and use stack images and enable seamless tones and colors. Okay, so let's go over it one more time. You're going to import all of these images as layers into a single new image you're going to go edit and auto blend the layers and rather than do the blend method in panorama like you're accustomed to you're going to go stack images and it's good and you're going to enable seamless tones and colors and click OK and what that's going to do is I'm going to back up it's going to give you an image and this is one where I probably took 25 or 30 points of focus on this image it's going to give you an image that has fantastic depth of focus, the kind of depth of focus that you almost can't get any other way. Now I'm going to introduce you briefly to Helicon Focus. I, I think it's kind of, I was telling David this morning, I thought it was kind of funny that um, all the images that are in here from the natural world, um, except for the example I was able to get from the Helicon uh, website, which is a biscuit. Now why they chose a biscuit, I guess, is simply because of the texture and dimensionality of it. Uh, very nice lighting setup, by the way. Notice the side lighting and a bit of lighting on the background to help create some dimensionality. Very, very nice uh, lighting setup. And this operates in much the same way. Helicon is much more sophisticated than the Adobe Camera Raw product. There's a lot of um, fine-tuning adjustments that you can make and a lot of customization that's available in this, in this application. If you're interested in focus stacking, uh, certainly try the Adobe Camera Raw and the Photoshop uh, tools first and become familiar with it. But at some point, I encourage you to go over to Helicon and take a look at this. I think you'll find it's very interesting. Now, let's talk a little bit about display calibration. Um, just briefly, put color aside for a moment. One of the things, that, the, the benefits that you get from display calibration is highlight and shadow control. And that's absolutely critical in an image where you're really looking to maximize the rendering of details. If you're not in control, for example, of the brightness of your screen, um, you're really going to be editing to an unknown destination. You're going to not really know what the highlights are going to look like when you go to a final display or print. And the same thing for the shadows. You've got to protect the detail in the highlights and shadows. The only way to do that is to have a mechanical device, an optomechanical device, like a display calibrator, and calibrate that screen to the right level of brightness and to get your colors correct. And, and the other reason to get your colors correct, other than color accuracy again, is if it's oversaturated, you're not going to be able to see the details either. So you really want to nail that display so that you're editing to a known quantity and that you can really um, you can really get what you want out of that photograph after you spend all that time putting your macro together. A similar thing applies uh, to printer calibration. Uh, if you are printing, um, certainly, I encourage you to, in, in, and we have a whole webinar that's recorded on the, on the Data Color website on printer calibration and, and printmaking and getting accurate printing and accurate detail. But the same things apply here as apply to calibrating your display, is that you want to be in the driver's seat when it comes to highlight and shadow detail, 
you really want to render your colors accurately, but also with the correct density. And the way to do that is to use application managed color with an ICC profile that's customized to your printer. Um, again, I won't get into a ton of detail about this, but my feeling is is that uh, if you're not working at least with ICC profiles from the manufacturer, uh, you're, you're selling yourself short as far as your printmaking goes. If you're using printer managed color, you're selling yourself short. That ICC profile is your friend, and if you really want to maximize the performance of your printer, do consider um, using printer calibration software to measure and calculate corrections and get your printer where it really needs to be. The other big benefit is, of course, is that your screen and your prints will match. Um, I can. I heard an open mic. David, you have something to add? Before you move on, I've had um, multiple people ask me about um, iPhone photography, and I did manage to twist your arm to put one iPhone image into this uh, into this webinar, but I don't see it mentioned anywhere in the text. So I thought I would mention that one of the great strengths, actually, of the newer iPhones and the other better recent um, phone cameras is their ability for macro shots. They, you know, are lousy for night shots and so-so for this kind of shot or that kind of shot, but they do excel uh, when there's sufficient light in doing macros. They focus the earlier uh, lenses do not focus close up. Now if you get a clip-on macro lens, they can be phenomenal, though they're, uh, the ones I've worked with have kind of a fixed focal length of about three quarters of an inch, which means you're doing well to fit a, a diamond ring into your focal range. You know, they're really for very small stuff. But simply the camera with no add-on at all does a very nice job of, of shooting things that are, oh, a couple of inches across, two, three, four inches across are, are very reasonable targets for uh, working with an iPhone as long as there's enough light. Now you're not going to get the, the number of pixels you get out of a big image, but um, oftentimes that's not your goal. I mean, there's, there's a scientific orientation in many of the questions I'm answering in this webinar where people want advanced technical data that, that you can only get from the manufacturer or someone who works with a particular product. And there's kind of a what's the highest resolution, best this, best that question. And the answer is that's funny. Most of my best macro shots are done with a, a lens baby or an iPhone. The camera that's there, the camera that'll catch that bee before it climbs out of that poppy. Uh, so it's not all about technique. It's not all about uh, technical components. A lot of it is about catching uh, a stunning image, good color, things sharpen and focus close up. And uh, if you look at it that way, you can have a fair amount of fun with macro photography without investing anything if you already own a, a, some kind of smartphone that's got a fairly good camera that will focus up quite close. And then, of course, using the applications that you can for, for editing your images on, uh, on smartphones also um, add to that, Snapseed being perhaps my favorite editing application for smartphones. But there are even, I believe, uh, image stacking functions that are available in smartphone apps. So I've not worked with one personally. So I'll let you get back to your uh, to your other subject matter, David. Okay. Um, while you were speaking, I was looking through some of the questions. One question that I saw come up fairly frequently was about ring flash. Um, or twin flashes. Certainly if you're out and about, um, the twin flash or the ring flash can be your friend because it's easy and fast to set up and it certainly beats the heck out of a single on-camera flash. Now you can spend a lot of money on like the model that I showed you, uh, the one from Nikon is fairly expensive. However, there are less expensive ones. Uh, typically provide continuous lighting. They're typically uh, LED or, or fluorescent. Um, they are much less expensive, but they don't throw as much light, which means that it's a little more difficult to stop down the lens and get really good depth of field from the photograph. Uh, so you kind of get what you pay for. Um, I hope that helps. Um, and I think there was another question. Give me one second here. Maybe. Oh yes, there was someone that asked about depth of field, and um, you know it seems like the depth of field is greater in some photos than other. Um, there's a couple of things that come into play. One of them is how much light you have to work with. If you have a lot of light to work with, you can really stop the lens down. 
and macro lenses are typically designed with superior um, aperture mechanisms so you can stop the lens down further than a normal lens without a penalty in terms of diffraction error or loss of focus. So that's one part of it. Another part of it is you don't always have to, you know, the closer you get, the, the more impact on depth of field. You don't always have to get right on top of the subject to take a macro shot. If you back up a little bit, you'll get a little bit more depth of field. So think about working back and forth from the subject. You know, if you back up a foot um, you, and you have a decent camera, you can always crop a little bit later and you still get the detail in your, in your image and, and, and be satisfied that you got the shot. I hope that uh, I hope that helps a little bit. One other question was on the uh, the manufacturer of the focusing rail that you mentioned. Would you? Oh, that's right. That? That's really right. Stuff makes that. Um, there's a couple of other companies that um, should come to mind, but at the moment I'm I'm having I'm having a senior moment. But really, right stuff makes the one that I like the best. And I also, for an L bracket, I uh, similarly answered that I recommend really right stuff's L brackets. I know several photographers who use them. They're really rugged. They're well machined. They're not inexpensive, but if you need a serious L bracket, take a look at the stuff that really right stuff offers. It's very robust construction. It's one of those things that you'll buy once in your lifetime. Um, there, I you know I have them on. I have the L brackets on every camera that I own simply because it's so much quicker and more reliable, by the way, than um, just about any other kind of camera mount uh, uh, that, I have, that I've used. Okay, we have a whole series of previously recorded topics um, on focus control, remote triggering. Um, both of those may be relevant to the interest of some of the people here. End-to-end -end color management. Um, soft proofing, still in motion capture, floral photography, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they've all been recorded. They're available online on the Data Color website. Uh, we have some new webinars coming up. We have one on safari photography with David Cardinal. Uh, on August 7th, we have a webinar on advanced photo composition. Uh, the last time we did this, it was very, very popular. What we do is we go through a whole series of photographs and we dissect them right, left, up, down, sideways, and we talk about how the photo was constructed, how it could be improved, what its strengths and weaknesses are. Uh, it's a really good learning experience for everybody. Um, we don't just use our own photographs either. We use photographs from people that we know that are, that are good at their craft, and so we can really show you some nice examples of, uh, of how to improve your work. On September 10th, We'll be doing selective color editing and, and adjustment. Um, that would be using Photoshop and Lightroom. Uh, very, very useful tools uh, in terms of improving both the, the color palette and the dimensionality of your images. And I strongly urge you to consider any of these uh, and put them on your schedule. I want to thank Data Color and Photo Deox and DIY Photography for sponsoring this webinar. Uh, their websites are listed right here at the top of the page. The data color discount um, is 20% off all Spider project products <laughs> purchased at spider.datacolor.com. The promo code is macro20 and it's valid through July 23rd, 2013. The photo deox discount is 20% off products on their website, photodeoxpro.com. The discount is Webinar FDX, and that's valid through July 30th, 2013. Now we have 14 giveaways total, so I'm not going to drag you through um, announcing all the names and all the people who have won things. You will get an email from Patty, our marketing manager, uh, telling you what you've won, if you've won something and what you have won, and she'll be asking you for info on where to send it. So keep your eye peeled. Um, Again, my name is David Saffer. I have a blog, davidsaffer.wordpress.com, that has a lot of tutorials and information on it. Uh, and as I said before, I'm perfectly happy to answer emails, dsaffer at mac.com. Please be patient. I get a lot of emails. If I don't answer your email in the first 24 hours, send the email again. It just means that uh, the, the first email got lost in the clutter, uh, and I will do my best to answer you. Uh, David Toby also has a wonderful blog at cdtoby.wordpress.com, 
and his website is cdtoby.com and there's a lot of good information on, on his WordPress blog that can be very, very helpful in your photography work. I want to thank you. One moment because yeah. uh, we did not mention the, um, the fact that this webinar will be recorded or is being recorded and will be available. Anyone who signed up for the webinar will get an email with uh, the URL for watching this webinar. If there's something you missed, you want to see again. If there's somebody you want to show this to, then you, you will be able to do that at a later time. Thank you. Thanks, David. So I thank everyone for your attention. Thanks for, thanks for coming by. We hope that you visit us again. Uh, and have a great day.